God, I, uh, I pray as, I, uh, as I'm about to unleash my tongue. God, it, uh, your words would speak through me. God, it is my greatest fear to get up here and not preach something that is not according to your sound doctrine. God, I pray that uh, your words would just fill me. And uh, God, I pray that the preparation that, that has gone into this sermon, Lord, that uh, you would speak to our hearts, our minds. God, that uh, you would challenge us. Uh, Lord, we do not want to come into this place and leave the same person every Sunday. God, we want to, we want to come out of here uh, pursuing holiness, uh, being a better person, and coming closer to you. God, I pray that the, the words I speak would do that today. God, I pray that you would uh, fill us, uh, fill our minds. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so today's topic, well, first I've got to share this. Um, on Good Friday, I don't know if you guys know, Daryl and Becky's been visiting with us, and they have a little granddaughter named Angel, and Good Friday, she drew me a little picture, and it had Jesus on it, and it was after the sermon that we preached on Good Friday. And this morning, I haven't even preached yet, and she drew me a picture, and so it's my cheat sheet today, so it just simply says Jesus, so if I get lost in my sermon, I can look down and say, Jesus, and we're good, so, you know, <laughs> that's what I'll do. Thanks to Angel, so... All right, so today's topic is, is the doctrine of sin. Uh, now, this is, this is a, some people are probably thinking, well, this is kind of elementary. How can you really make a sermon out of sin? I mean, isn't that kind of what we kind of talk about that every Sunday? You know, I, sin is very complex. And I think some of us, we, we kind of approach it very casually as Christians. And, and it almost, it kind of loses its effect on us sometimes. It, it really is a grave matter. It really is a huge matter. In fact, uh, when I was preparing for Good Friday, this is the thing that kind of kept coming. So this is like part two of the Good Friday service, if you made it to the Good Friday. Um, I really don't think you can understand uh, the grace of the cross without a proper perspective of what sin really is. We don't have a... You can't see God as a great Savior until you see how great we are at sinning. Um, so with that backdrop, that's where I'm going to begin. So with that, now some of us probably have relatives or friends that really, they don't, they don't even acknowledge that there is sin. In fact, there's some people that really say, well, it's all relative, right? Sin's not a reality. Now, you've met these people. They're kind of on the extreme side. They're, fortunately, they're rare, but they're, they do exist. And I would have to say this to them. Can you identify with sin? I think this is where, this is where you have to drill in. If you're trying to give somebody the right perspective on sin, uh, John Calvin says this, you need two things. There's two ingredients to understanding sin and getting that right perspective. One, it's wisdom of, and knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Those are the two ingredients. A lot of people have knowledge of self. Even the kids this morning when they got up here, what's right and wrong? Well, they had no problem listing off things, you know. You, but you, you'll have some people that, you know, there's really no right or wrong. You know, they're just, it's just relative, right? I don't even understand how they can even use terms like right and wrong. Like they have no foundation for even using ethical language. If they don't believe right and wrong really exist, how can they even talk about that kind of thing? So, you know, how do you box these people in a corner? How do you, how do you get people to admit, hey, there is a right and wrong? I think given enough time, you have, to, you have to kind of say, you know, is anything right and wrong? And I think what you do is you kind of corner them by, by saying questions like this and then start giving them context. Well, if I punch you in the face, is that right or wrong? Well, to you it may be right or it may be wrong. You know, they might start backpelling up. Well, if I take a mother from his child, is that right or wrong? Oh, now you're starting to get sensitive with them. Eventually, they're going to get to the point and they say, well, no, that's definitely wrong. You know, I, I love the person that tries to be relative and says, there are no absolutes. I always say, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> you know, what about that statement you just said? So. You can box people in a corner. Okay, so you get them to the point where they have knowledge of self. They get to the point where they say, okay, there are rights and wrongs. There are certain things. But how do you come up with that foundation? When man is your version of what's right and wrong, it's all about me, right? That's where they come up with it. So now so you've still got knowledge of self without God. Man is the center of your universe. Man is the foundation for your ethics and your morals. Now, can man ever get anything wrong? As we have, as a moral majority, Ever gotten anything wrong? Has our moral conscience ever, ever done anything? I'd point you, this is one of the things that I'd like to point you to. Back in the 70s, Roe v. Wade. Abortion was, was morally acceptable by the majority. And since then, millions upon millions of babies have been killed since then. Unborn babies have been destroyed since the 70s. That's a genocide that's, it can pay, I mean, 
it pales in comparison to all other genocides in human history, in my opinion. You have other genocides. This is Saddam Hussein, when he had mass burial graves, he collected the shoes. I didn't put any mass burial graves up there because it's just too graphic to show in service. But the, you know, there's been tons of times in cultures and societies where they have decided as a majority that this ethnic group has to be cleansed. We'll get rid of them. That's genocide. Now that's kind of going extreme, right? That's saying, okay, well, man's moral majority doesn't always do that. I mean, for the basics, you know, America's a pretty safe place to live. We're pretty, we're pretty good people for the most part, right? Maybe. Let me, let me just take you another touchy subject. You know, same-sex marriage recently. That's now all of a sudden an equality issue. I don't know if how many of you have noticed that, okay, it doesn't hurt me. Why should I be against it? I mean, I've even heard Christians say that. You know, why should I take a stand against something like that? It doesn't affect me. Well, I would say it does affect you just as much as any immoral act would do. The question is, it's not, a, it's not a question about equality with homosexuality or same-sex marriage. It's a question about morality. It's a question about, just as much as a man cheating on his wife is immoral, so is same-sex marriage. Just as much as looking at porn is immoral, so is same-sex marriage. It's, it's not relative. It's not equality. And really, if you think about it, okay, we redefine marriage. Where do you draw the lines now? All of a sudden, it's okay for man and man and woman and woman. What about man and beast? What about man and child? What about any, I mean, everything's on the table now. If you can't draw the line somewhere, where can you draw the line? It's all morally relative, right? The majority can decide as it goes, so. All right, so the effects of the sin. You don't have to be Einstein to see the effects of sin. They're numerous, aren't they? There's suffering, there's injustice, there's evil, there's sickness, there's loss, there's death. We've had a number of deaths lately in this church. And there's pain. There's all kinds of things that we are affected by with sin. Now, man has not, you know, let this go unnoticed. Man has knowledge of self. So they've tried to self-correct this, right? We've, we've had wars to try to correct. We've tried to manage sin. We go out and we fight the bad guys. We try to get rid of the bad guys and make sure there's no more bad guys and we're all good guys, right? That hasn't helped. We've tried to educate the problem away. We erect schools all over the place. Some of the schools now are, are some of the most heinous places for, for the most vile sins, in fact. You know, so education hasn't quite worked. We've thrown money at the problem of sin. We continue to throw our money at the problem of sin and it's not necessarily getting any better. We've tried medicine. We've made all kinds of advanced medical technologies. We've thrown pills at people and try to self-correct sin with a pill. Now, I'm not necessarily saying all these things are wrong and that we shouldn't try to pursue things to try to manage sin. My point is not that the fact that managing sin is bad. It's the fact that we can't do it entirely by ourselves. Only God can fix sin. Man can attempt to fix sin, but he can't do it. Only God can really fix it. This is, this is the doctrine. This is, now let's get into the meat of it a little bit. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is the idea of total depravity. We kind of talked about this a little bit in our Sunday school class this morning, that the whole, everything has been affected by the original sin. The, the title of the sermon, I don't know if you notice, Forbidden Fruit, Always in Season. Don't you long for the day when that forbidden fruit is not in season? You know? It's always in season, and it's available every day. Every single day since the fall, it's been available to us. The, the, the doctrine of sin is a big deal. You know, we as Christians need to be able to articulate this and how grave and how serious of a matter this is. This is important. You can't see the cross for what it really is if you can't see the depravity of us for what it really is. It says here, the heart is deceitful above all things. Think about this. You get the mindset again of the people that say, oh, I'm really not that bad. Well, that's pride. And that's a sin. And you're at the front of the line. So <laughs> you've deceived yourself into thinking something that you're not, to think you're not that bad. All right, so Genesis 1, we're, or Genesis chapter 3, we're, we're into the original, the fall. If you're going to follow along with us, I'm going to be in Genesis most of the morning. So Genesis 3, chapter 1, or chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. 
He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may be eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now let's start with Satan. He's called crafty here. Now there's a lot of mystery in Genesis. You know, we're kind of just along in the garden and all of a sudden Satan comes along. Well, the Bible hasn't addressed Satan at this point. We don't know where he came from, how he got there. He just shows up on the scene. Um, And the Bible says he's crafty. Now, we have a little more hindsight. We have more verses to go with this. Uh, We have in Isaiah, at least we think this is about Satan. Uh, Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. That's one verse we think it may be about Satan. Here's one that we don't have to guess about. Revelations 12, 9. The great, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, what do we know from this? Well, right away, we know his mission. What is his mission? It's to lead us astray. And guess what? He's got friends with him. It says, and his angels went with him. So he's not alone in that effort. That should scare us a little bit. All right, something else about Satan. When the thousand years are over, this is talking about the post-millennium, uh, Satan will be released from the prison and he will go out and deceive the nations. He's a deceiver. This is part of his mission, is to deceive people. Everything has to do with a lie with Satan. Skipping down to verse 10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, we at least know his fate. We know, we know what he's doing now, but we also know his fate. So I find great comfort in the fact that he's, his destiny is made up. All right, so back to Genesis. Now the serpent, he is crafty. Now women, why are you talking to crafty snakes in the first place? It begs the question. Now men, you can talk to crafty snakes as well. There's just as many crafty snakes out there trying to lure you away. But in general, women, stay away from crafty snakes. All right, so the serpent is crafty. How is he crafty? If you skip down, he says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree? That's only one word he added to there, any tree. That's the lie, in fact, right there. God didn't say any tree. God said a specific tree, a single tree in the garden. That, you know, isn't it amazing how one little word can change the context of what you think God's word really said? This is how Satan is. He comes in, he says, he adds one little word to something, and all of a sudden, Everything's thrown off a little bit. And look how the woman reacts. She says, no, you must not eat from the fruit of that tree, a specific tree. She corrects him, but at the same time, she's already starting to get a little muddled up. Because look, she adds something to the equation. And you must not touch it. God never said you must not touch it. She added that to it. He said you must not eat it. All right. So just, just in general, how does sin start? How does it begin? Here's how it begins. Genesis gives us a picture. By doubting God's word. Think about this. The Satan comes up and he says, did God really say that? What he's really trying to do, he's trying to doubt and undermine God's scripture, his authority in scripture. That's where sin starts to happen. You start to say, well, God's words really, he didn't really mean it. Surely he didn't mean it that way. Maybe he meant it differently. Or maybe he meant it for those people and not me. I'm the exception to the rule. So this is where sin starts. It starts with doubting God's word. All right, let's continue. Oh, something else that's going on here. Satan is whispering in this woman's ear. Notice just a little bit of time with Satan, and she's already started to muddle things up. She says, oh, you can't touch it. That's not true either. If you hang around the wrong company, you start getting God's word a little bit muddled. It starts to not be so clear anymore. Who's whispering in your ear? Who has your attention? Who's, who's telling you things in your ear? Who are you giving your attention to that doesn't deserve it right now? He says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. We're in four to six now. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing God and evil. Good and evil, sorry. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, I want you to notice the progression. I'm going to kind of go through this a little slowly. First, Satan appears to her eyes. First, she's listening to him. Notice all the senses that are getting used here, too. 
First she's listening. She's hearing something that's causing her to doubt. Next he's saying, hey, look at your eyes. Look, then what do your eyes see look beautiful? He says, your eyes are going to be opened. You'll be like God. Isn't that what we all want? Be like God? I'd love to be like God. I want to call the shots. So what did the woman do? After a little bit of enticing, a little bit of temptation from Satan, here's what the woman did. She saw, and it was pleasing to the eye. It was desirable. She looked at it and she said, yeah, I could gain wisdom here. I have something to gain. God's withholding something from me. This is how sin also tempts us. Is somehow we get this crazy idea in our head that somehow God's withholding something from us that we deserve. First we doubt God's word. Then all of a sudden we start saying, well, God's holding back on us. He's, he's, not, he's not giving us everything we deserve. Well, there's something here to be said about this desire, this lust in the heart and this lust of the eyes. John says it really well. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And in verse 16, really pay attention to this one. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. What are your eyes fixed on? There's a connection here that's being made between sin and your eyes and your senses. What do you spend your time, what is your gaze fixed on? Well, if you're in sin, it's probably on something it shouldn't be fixed on. You know, if it's not in sin, chances are you're fixed on the Word. You're fixed on things that, that bring you closer to God. We have to be very careful what we let into our eyes. We have to be very careful. Because the lust of our eyes are what put us in a place we don't belong. So the second progression. So first we doubt God's words. Then we see something. We start lusting after it. We start thinking of God as some evil dude that's holding something back from us. He's distorting our perspective, Satan is. All right, then where, where's Adam? So we've talked about Eve so far. Where's Adam in this? When the women saw the fruit and the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. Okay, she committed the sin. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he, what? And he said, Satan, get behind me. No, we wish. He said, no. He's, well, here's what we wish. We wish he was a First Peter kind of dude. First Peter 3, he's supposed to love her. He's supposed to protect her. He's supposed to watch out for her. What is he doing? What is he doing? Here's what I want you to hear. Nothing. What is he doing? He's doing nothing. This is the sin of omission. This is the one, this is the one that's probably the most personal to me. This is the idea that you sit back and you just let sin happen. You do nothing. You ask this guy, you say, hey, are you looking at porn? No. Nope. Are you going to church? No. Nope. You're reading your Bible? No. Nope. Are you murdering somebody? No. Nope. Well, what do you do? Nothing. The guy does nothing. All the while, he thinks he's a good guy. That's the crime in all this. He thinks he's a good guy. He's not doing anything. It's the sin of omission. This is the one that we probably don't recognize in ourselves as much. This is the things that we should be doing that we're not doing. See, God calls us, He's accountable to us, or we're accountable to Him, in the sense that there's sins of commission, where you willfully do something you should not do, and there's sins of omission, things that you should be doing that you're not doing. And this is the sin of Adam. What's interesting about this is, in the New Testament, any time sin is mentioned, Eve is never mentioned. It's Adam's sin that's mentioned. It's Adam's fall. What is Adam doing? Nothing. This is, this is the original sin. Nothing. This is where we, this is dangerous territory we're in here. He ate. Well, he did do something. He ate. He joined her in her sin. You know, that's what happens when you hang around sinful people. You end up joining them in their sin, unfortunately. So we start by doubting God's words. We lust in our hearts. And then we commit either the sin of omission, which is Adam, or the commission, which is Eve. Here, let's move on. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is kind of a pitiful sight, isn't it? I mean, think about this. All of a sudden, they're exposed. They realize, oh, mercy me, I got no clothes on. <laughs> it's, it's kind of embarrassing when you walk into a scene and you got no clothes on. You feel vulnerable. You try to put yourself in this mindset. So this idea of clothes 
and sin are related. Again, the senses are all being picked up on in the Genesis. Think about this and how they reacted. They tried to do what we talked about earlier. What they do? They managed their sin. They just start trying to sew fig leaves together. I've never done this, but I imagine that's probably quite hard to just go out into nature and start sewing some fig leaves for clothes. I, I, how effective can you really be making your own covering? This is what man tries to do. We try to cover our own sin. We try to cover our own shame. Once it's discovered, we're like, oh no, got to do something about that. And then we make pitiful attempts at it. And that's what they're doing. But the gravest thing that's going on here is the relationship has now changed. They're naked. They are exposed. They're vulnerable. There's a loss of innocence that's going on here. They're no longer innocent. They were happy a moment ago in the garden, not eating of the fruit. Now they're not so happy. They're a little bit embarrassed. So verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. How silly is this? from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now, I don't think God could not find them on the God locator. I, I, you know, God made heaven and earth. I, I think he could have found them. I don't think he asked questions for his benefit, but for our benefit. I think he was trying to expose them for what was going on. I think he, it's like a, a parent finding a child when they've done something wrong. You kind of give them a chance to owe up to it, don't you? You kind of want them to do the right thing. Just tell me what you did wrong, and all will be forgiven. But unfortunately, it's not what our kids do, is it? We have to beat it out of them sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it's painful. Uh, so they hid themselves. That's another sermon for another day, I guess. Um, they hid themselves. So what's going on here? Well, there's separation from God. Here's the progression. They doubt God's word. They lust with their eyes. They commit the sin, the loss of innocence. And now they're separated from God. That's a pretty grave consequence. Now, notice, that's their choice. They are hiding themselves. They want to separate themselves from God. But it is a natural byproduct of sin, is it not? When you sin, there is separation between you and the Almighty. Your relationship is no longer the same when you sin. All right, moving on. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. I like that word, afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? He's afraid. Notice here what I want you to see is he's ashamed. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. When you're standing in front of holiness, you're going to look a lot worse in front of something that's holy. In fact, you notice sinful people don't like to be around holy people because it's kind of, you know, it convicts them. They don't want to see it. They might have to change if they're around a holy person because it might change how they live. You know, that's, that's hard. So they're ashamed now. They're vulnerable. They're naked. They're afraid. Now, think about this. Their relationship was pretty darn good up until this point. They used to walk in the, in the garden with the, a loving father. Now, do they see him as a loving father anymore? What changed? It's different now. Now they see him as the mean ogre. You know, that's what sin does. Sin changes how you look at God. God is a loving God, but yet somehow they don't see him that way right now. They're afraid of him. They were walking with him. They were walking in the garden with God. I can't wrap my mind around this. You know, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of debate in Genesis, whether it's literal or figurative. I, to me, it really doesn't matter where you fall in that debate. The, the, the intention of the author here is theology. There's no debate about the relationship between God and what is being said in Genesis and what happens in Genesis. All right. Verse 12, verse 13. The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Notice the blame. Who is he blaming? He's not necessarily blaming the, the woman. He, I mean, he is. But he's actually saying, You put her here. You did this, God, to me. You know, if you're Eve, how do you feel with this statement around you? Oh, man, that's rough. My husband says, in other words, it'd be better if I had never existed. That's what he's saying. In other words, he's saying, God, I'd be better off without her. Oh, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid I said that about my wife. I'd be better off without you. That's where he is right now. That's what sin will do. It'll separate your spouses. 
It'll separate you and your marriage. It'll separate you and your relationship with others. That's what sin does. It drives a wedge between you and the people that you love. Or you should love. Or should protect. Again, Adam was not a First Peter 3 kind of guy. He ate it. Okay, then we move on to the woman. The Lord said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me. Again, Satan's mission. He is a deceiver. He is to tell us a lie. And we are to buy into the lie. And that's what happened here. And she ate. So what has happened? There's separation from each other now. Separation from God. There's separation from each other. There's shame. There's loss of innocence. All kinds of stuff going on here. Finally, we get the condemnation here. We started with the temptation. Now we've gone to the condemnation. So God's going to, it's time to pay up. It's time to reconcile. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I love the fact that God is constantly putting Satan in his place. That never in a time does the Bible ever give us the impression that God can't do what he wants with Satan. There's always, God's always got a leash on him. There's never a time he is not in control and not putting him in his place where he belongs. Now he starts to put us in our place. In the midst of all this, in the midst of the sin, the greatest rejection that God probably feels from us, there's grace offered here in verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Offspring is singular here. He's talking about Jesus. This is called the, there's a fancy word for it, proto-evangelion or something like that. It's the first gospel. This is the first prediction of Christ. How fitting for God to preach the first sermon, the first prediction of Christ. So he says, there will be an offspring. He will crush your head. And that's what he did on the cross. He crushed his head. And you will strike him. And he was stricken on the cross. So in the midst of all this pain, in the midst of all this, God provides a covering for him. Later you'll read that God ends up killing an animal and provides an adequate covering for their nakedness. Now, all sin requires some kind of sacrifice. That, that blood atonement. You know, think about how gory of a, of a picture that must have been. No animal had been killed at this point on earth. And God slaughters an animal right before their eyes. The grossness of it all must have just been the shock value of it all. And they're seeing blood for the first time. And then God uses that as their covering. Here's the picture of the covering. God is starting to instill this idea of atonement, that He does the atoning. He does the covering, not us. We can't manage our sin. We can't fix our sin. Only God can fix it. Only He can cover it. We move on. So what I want you to get from this idea is there's no peace. We talked about peace this morning in Hebrews this morning, about pursuing peace. God has called us to pursue peace. The Hebrew word for this is shalom. There is no shalom on this earth, is there? I mean, we look around, there's problems everywhere. The earth is not in a state of shalom, a state of peace. It will not be so until Jesus comes. Because Jesus is the prince of shalom, peace. We, sin will not cause peace in your home. Sin will disturb things. So we talk about sin a lot. We ought to define it. How about we define it? We'll try to see what it is. Uh, Wayne Grudem says this. He says, any failure to conform to moral law of God in these ways, either word, that's something you say or type, deed or motive, and really, the, this is the, the one that most people will find when you start studying the doctrine of sin, is it's simply missing the mark. It's like the arrow that's off target. You just can't hit the mark. Romans 3.23 says, uh, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all short. Only one has gotten the A+, plus, and it ain't us. All right, so what are the causes of sin? Well, they are numerous. Uh, let's start with <laughs> Uh, 2 Timothy 3 is kind of like the sewer of causes for sin. If you were looking for the sewer of motivation for sin, 2 Timothy 3 gets it. Uh, starting with verse 2, people will be lovers of themselves. Let's just stop right there. Lovers of themselves. Think about this culture. They teach us you have to love yourself. You know, Oprah wants us to stare at our belly button and fall in love with herself or something. You know, it's just, you see the car commercials. You deserve it. Fall in love with yourself. You deserve it. You have to get these things. The problem is not loving ourselves. The problem is denying ourselves. 
We talked about this in Sunday school this morning too. Brian brought up the verse, daily I must deny myself and take up my cross and follow him. So we are lovers of money. We are chasing greed. We are boastful. We are proud. This is both Adam and Eve. Took pride to t pick up that, to take and do what God told him not to do. We're abusive. We're disobedient to our parents. We're ungrateful. We're unholy. We're without love. We're unforgiving. We're slanderous. Without self-control. They had no self-control. We have no self-control. We are working on it through the Holy Spirit to have self-control. If you were saved and in His grace, you are working it. But we don't. It's an illusion to think that we have self-control. It's a deception. It's a lie to think that somehow you have control over your sin. We are brutal. We are not lovers of good. We are treacherous. We're, we're rash. We're conceited. Lovers of pleasure. Think about that verse. We, we, her eyes were fixed on something that looked good. That she thought somehow that God was withholding something that she should have. And that's how we look at sin sometimes. Somehow we think it's something that God's holding back on us. No, not the case. All right, James 3.16, it says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there, there you will find disorder and evil practice. In other words, wherever you find a selfish person, you will find every vile practice. Isn't that true? Everywhere you find selfishness, you find evil practices being done there. Uh, Galatians 5.19 says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Notice the thread. Selfish, selfish, selfish. Every time you think of sin, think of self. That's where it really comes down to. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the likes. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then finally, we have in Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. See to it, brothers, you and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Some of us just have an unbelieving heart. This is the people I was talking about earlier that just, sin, it's not real. They have an unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Again, sin is deceitful. It's a lie. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now, sometimes our cause for sin is because we're just plain not smart. We're just not educated enough. We need to get into the Word so we know that some of the things that we're doing are sinful, in fact. So these are some of the causes of sin. Now, are there degrees of sin? Now, this is an interesting topic that I've come about. The answer to that is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that judicially, we're all guilty, right? We're all sinners and account, accountable for our sin, and it's worthy of punishment. So judicially, we're all the same. Sin in front of the cross is all the same. But not all sin, all, not all consequences of sin are the same, are they? It would be a lie to say that. Actually, Leviticus 5, if you want to, believe it or not, <laughs> Jared was on the right track this morning. Un, there's unintentional and intentional sin. Did you know that even the unintentional sins that you commit, God holds you accountable for? But if you continue to read in Leviticus 5, it talks about the fact that there's different punishment levels for them. You are held there is a more severe punishment for intentional sins than there are unintentional sins. Okay? So there are degrees, the way the Bible reads. John 19, 11, uh, I think I messed up on that verse there. I think it's 19, 11. Uh, forget the five that's up there. Um, Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate is asking, uh, or Jesus is asking, who committed the greater sin? And I believe that's a reference to Judas when he's talking there. And so there's this idea that there are greater sins. Um, even from Jesus' own lips, you hear that. James 3.1, it says, teachers, they're judged more severely. It says, you know, ought not teach. Not everybody should be a teacher because they will be judged more harshly. 1 Corinthians 6.18-20, it talks about sexual immorality. And it talks about it in such a way that it, when you commit sexual sin, it's against your own body. You know, and that's different than other sins. Um, so there are different degrees to what sin the consequences and how, how they play out. Now, the opposite is true also, if you're still not convinced. Uh, Revelations uh, 22, verse 12, the Bible teaches rewards for different faithfulness. So just as there are degrees of sin, there's degrees for faithfulness. We should not all think that when we get to heaven, we're all going to get the same rewards. We are going to all be rewarded with salvation, the ultimate reward. But it's not all going to be the same for us when we get there. There are different degrees of faithfulness that the Bible indicates. 
All right, so what is a response to sin? These are just some of the responses to sin. These are not necessarily good responses. These are just responses. All right, so one, it's just breaking the rules, isn't it? I mean, have you heard this? Oh, it's just a, it, it's kind of a minimizing way of looking at it. No, I would say to you, it is not breaking the rules. It is a personal assault on God. When you break the rules, when you sin, it is a personal assault on God. Well, Jesus died for me. I can do whatever I want now. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking, did Christ die and raise from the grave so I can continue to go on sinning? Heavens no, Paul said. He says, I beat myself into submission. I beat my body down so that I might not sin. You need to repent of this idea if you got this idea in your head. You cannot continue to go on sinning. God did not raise from the grave so that you could keep on sinning. God knows my heart. This is, this is almost like saying, I'm, I'm innocent. Yeah, I do a couple bad things, but God knows my heart. I really mean to do well. But God doesn't deal with you on your intentions. He deals with what you do. And your heart is wicked, as, as Jeremiah said. It is wicked, and you are deceiving yourself to thinking that you're a good person. Uh, you're not. <laughs> uh, your, your lifestyle is a reflection of what's in your heart. Everything you do in your life is a, is a reflection of what's in your heart. Well, sin is fun. I want to keep doing it because it's fun. Well, Hebrews 11 talks about this. There are fleeting pleasures in sin, but they're only for a moment. Keep in mind the consequences. There is separation from God. There's separation from each other. Well, it's not sin if no one gets hurt. Talk about that too. God gets hurt. God gets hurt by our sin. Others get hurt by our sin. It's only sin if you get caught. I think my kids feel this way, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> this is the idea that somehow your private sins are affecting no one. And I would argue to, to this day to, that that's not true. I believe, you know, if you're a guy in your home looking at porn, your wife knows it. She feels it. She senses it. There's distance there. Sin creates barriers between you and the ones you love. Now, here's the other extreme. This is kind of, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning too. This is like every element in Sunday school was in this this morning. Um, this is the person that turns everything into a sin issue. Now, there are clear things in the Bible. There are clear black and whites that are, that are you don't do it. Now, there are people that somehow will take the gray areas of the Bible, the things that aren't so clear, and they will make their conscience a rule over somebody else's. Now, this is the essence of legalism. Now, I'm not arguing against necessarily obeying your conscience. I think you do. You, if you feel it's wrong, then it's wrong to you. Don't do it. You must obey your conscience. But I am saying you don't hold your conscience over somebody else's opinion in a gray area. That's not what we're called to do. Not everything is a sin. It may be a sin for you, but it may not be for somebody else. All right, we minimize it. We already kind of talked about this. I'm the exception to the rule. First Peter doesn't apply to me. I can scream at my wife anytime I want, right? No, it applies to you. Everybody. Is a... And then there's blame shifting. We already saw that. Now, there's this other idea is overly merciful. Everyone's a victim. Now, this can be dangerous, too, for some of us that, that you know, it's out of good intention. You know, we, we care about others. We want to show mercy. We want to forgive. But in some cases, you've got to be careful. Sometimes you're an enabler. If, if you're overly merciful, sometimes you are just helping that person to remain in their sin. And we have to be very careful about that. All right. This is what my kids do all the time. I caught them in the act. Let's change the subject on dad. He's not smart enough to figure this out. <laughs> we can't change the subject. And then there's worldly sorrow. Some people will respond to their sin with worldly sorrow. What this is is basically saying, I feel bad for the consequences, but I don't necessarily feel bad about the sin itself. A lot of people will feel sorrow. They'll have this worldly sorrow about what they did, and they'll feel really bad about it, and they come off feeling really bad about it, but they're not really sorry for the sin. They're not really sorry for doing it. All right, well, how does God respond to sin? Those are some of the ways that we respond to the sin that's not good. Here's how God responds to sin. Romans, uh, I can't remember the verse now. 6.23. Judges, <laughs> for the wages of sin is death. God judges sin. That's what he does. He's a judge. He teaches us about sin. Anywhere you look in the Bible, 
you can read, it's about sin and Jesus. Those two topics are everywhere. <laughs> and he teaches about covering. He offers us, what does he teach us about sin? The response to sin? God responds to sin. He offers us a covering. It's only in Jesus that we have a covering in sin. And he also offers repentance. Now, I haven't really talked about this too much, but really, the right response to any sin, for any of us, is to repent. That is what we should be doing. Why do we repent if God's already saved us? If salvation is already the checks in the mail, why do we repent? Good question, right? Well, it changes our character. Well, here's the answer. It restores fellowship. We repent because we want to be in right relationship with God. We repent of our sin because we no longer want to be separated from God, or our loved ones for that matter. We repent of the things like not picking up the dishes when the wife has asked us to pick up the dishes. Something simple like that can go a long way in a marriage. When you start respecting your wife, you start respecting and honoring God, it goes a long way. That's the correct response to sin. So I'll leave you just with two thoughts. As our Nigerian friends are booting up down there, I love them. Uh, our response to sin, uh, Ephesians 4, it says, we were dead in our trespasses. That's where we are. That's, where we are. That's, that's what happens to us when we sin. We're dead. That's, the wages of sin is dead. But Ephesians 4 gives us a but God. But by the grace of God, we can be forgiven. Romans 5 it talks about your sin, you're, you're one of two types of people. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Which one are you today? Are you the kind of person that has your eyes fixed on the things of God? Are you listening to the things of God? Or are you letting other things gaze your attention? Are you hearing the thoughts of the world and pursuing it? This is a grave, important matter for us as Christians. We cannot take sin lightly. We cannot go through life thinking sin is just relative. We cannot go through life ignoring sin. We can't go through life not being able to explain this to somebody. We can't go through life not being able to articulate how important the backdrop of sin is so we can see the holiness of Christ. God is not a great Savior until you can see how great of a sinner we really are. Let's pray here. God, I thank you so much 